welcome to another episode of Bike Fit Tuesdays. We're filming a bunch of these today, so subscribe to this channel for more. Today's episode is on saddle setup and everything you need to know to be able to set up your own. Take it away. Taking it away. We're gonna start off with saddle height. This is really difficult to do on your own and the reason for it is there are so many things that come into fruition. Not everybody has one saddle height. Most people can operate within a range. And saddle height essentially is dictated by the length of your legs, how long they are will yield a higher saddle height, your flexibility, your ability to extend your legs, and also the size of your feet. The bigger your feet are, the longer they are, therefore the more they can reach through the bottom of the stroke. Saddle height essentially is about not overreaching through the bottom of the stroke, so having to point the toes, the need to point the toes or plant to flex the foot through the bottom of the stroke and not impinging the hips through the top. Now the problem with the hip thing is that can be influenced by lots of other factors and we're going to discuss that later on as well. There isn't a particularly easy way of setting up saddle height per se, but what we're looking for is smoothness and fluidity. The other thing to consider here is that when you're climbing, when the front of the bicycle is elevated, you pedal differently. People dorsiflex their feet so they drop the heel a lot more. The reason I'm saying this is that you need to base your saddle height on your ability to drop the heel through the bottom of the stroke. So for your reference, we're gonna put, we're gonna show you two images, two, um, two lots of video analysis footage from our friend Mary Spender. I hope, Mary, I hope you don't mind us using this. Uh, <laughs> but it was Fran's idea, not mine. So uh, the, the, the first shot is, uh, shows very clearly uh, overextension of the leg. We're talking 147 and a half degrees. It's probably about seven degrees beyond what I would normally expect. And there's 26 and a bit degrees of plantar flexion. So the act of pointing her toes through the bottom of the stroke. Essentially what's happening here is that as she overextends the leg and then points the toe through the bottom of the stroke, she loses control through the bottom of the stroke. If we go to the next shot, we're looking at 138 and a half degrees of leg extension, so significantly less extension and only 19 and a half degrees of plantar flexion. So what we can see here is that we're not pointing the toe as much through the bottom of the stroke and we're not snatching uh, at the bottom of the stroke anymore. What we're looking for is smoothness and fluidity. We're not looking for a staccato pedaling dynamic, all right? There seems to be a trend in certain bike fitting circles to run excessive saddle height in the name of opening up the hips. As you raise the saddle height higher and higher through the top portion of the stroke, at the top of the stroke, the top dead center, your hip is more open, you, as in you, ha you, don't, you don't have to close the hip down quite so much. The problem with this is when you get to the bottom of the stroke, you, you lose control of the foot. It's worth noting that you can influence hip function in a lot of different ways, not just saddle height. Uh, a saddle setback, which we're gonna come, to, come on to in a minute, dramatically, influ improve, um, dramatically influences hip function, but so does crank length, cleat location, stance width, shoe choice. The, all of these factors will hugely influence your, your, your hip function. So saddle height shouldn't be used, in my opinion, as a means of opening up your hips. So saddle fore aft or saddle setback it basically refers to the horizontal placement of the saddle. It can be influenced in a number of different ways. It's worth noting that there is between 20 and 30 millimeters of uh, horizontal adjustment simply by just adjusting the saddle on its rails. Altering saddle fore aft influences a number of factors. It influences, for a start, saddle height. The further forward you run the saddle, the closer the saddle becomes to the bottom bracket or to the pedals, which means that, which renders a, a lower saddle height. The further back you take it, the more you increase the saddle height. So if you're experimenting with saddle setback, it's worth noting that you'll need to set, you'll, you'll need to adjust your saddle height accordingly. It's, it's about one to three. So for every three millimeters you move the saddle, horizontally, you need to adjust it up or down by a millimeter. Secondly, it influences hip function. The further forward you have the saddle, the more it improves your ability to get over the top of the stroke. This is typically common uh, in, in triathlon and time trial circles when you look at a triathlon bike. The seat angle of the, of the bicycle, uh, the angle of, of the seat tube here, is typically much, much steeper, which enables you to uh, get over the top of the stroke a little bit more easily. Uh, furthermore, if, we sit, if you run the saddle further and further back, it tends to impinge the hips more so. Rather obviously, saddle setback or altering saddle setback also influences your reach to the handlebars. Now this is something that you, you really should try and avoid. You do not want to be measuring, messing around with a saddle setback as a means of reducing the reach because it alters too many other factors. The further forward you run the saddle, the more you reduce the reach to the handlebars. The more rearward it is, the more it increases the reach from the handlebars. And finally, weight distribution. The saddle's horizontal placement in space heavily impacts a rider's weight distribution. The further forward we run it, 
The more it puts weight into the front of the bike, the further back we run it, the more it takes weight off, off of the front of the bike. I use saddle setback as a means of optimizing weight distribution for the most part, and you need to take into consideration here rider physiology. So if you have an individual with a short torso, uh, particularly common in ladies, but not always, uh, they will tend to need less setback, so the saddle will need to be further forward. Uh, one other way of achieving this might be to fit an inline seat post. I'm gonna get onto that in a minute. Individuals who are bulkier, have larger heads, rugby player types, uh, women, I'm sad to say, who are very, very well endowed will typically need a little bit less setback, usually in combination with less reach and less handlebar drop, as a means of offloading that weight. We need to take into consideration an, the specific needs of an individual. So perhaps look at your morphology a little bit. You know, are you a slender individual with a short torso and long legs? Maybe look at uh, have, running the saddle further forward. If you're the opposite to that, maybe run it slightly further back. The ways that you can do this though, and it's worth experimenting at home, is you can change your seat post. Now this is becoming more difficult with the sort of integrated bikes that we're starting to see, but more traditional bike styles, you can get different styles of seat posts. Should we show the viewers uh, an example? Most commonly what you'll find on a bike is a 25 millimeter setback. There are 35 mil iterations of these. The 25 millimeters refers to the clamp area being 25 millimeters behind the main shaft of the seat post. <laughs> shaft. In contrast to that, you have an inline or zero setback. Okay, and what that means is the clamp is directly on top of the seat, uh, the seat post shaft. Now what that means is that it brings the saddle further further forward and enables you to get, get the saddle much, much further forward. I find myself using these a lot for, as I said, uh, people with short torsos and long legs. It's worth noting there are just as many men out there with short torsos and long legs as there are women. It's a particularly problematic shape in bike fitting because it predisposes you to being stretched out. And typically you're better off on an endurance orientated bike, but that's for another video. I would say start in the middle of the rails. To be honest with you, you want to try and aim for the saddle to be in the middle of the rails anyway, because if you run it excessively far forward, what happens is it tends to, um, it tends to asymmetrically load the rail. So you're much more prone to saddle failures. It's the same as if you run it way too far back. You also find that as you start to load the saddle, the, the saddle will actually flex. So when the saddles run really, really far back, it will flex like this, which will pitch it nose up. Likewise, if you have it too far forward, it will pitch it nose down. And that leads us on to our next piece. First thing to consider here is that saddle pitch will differ from saddle to saddle. Uh, what we're looking for really, the, the, the role of the saddle is to support and stabilize the pelvis. And for the most part, what we're looking for is for the seating area to be flat. We do not want a slope. What happens when we put something on a slope? It falls off. This does also tend to uh, result in an over enlistment of the quadriceps, which tends to result in people cramping. Uh, also, you, also, you typically find that the rider gravitates to the nose. Cue gentle numbness and saddle issues. So we're looking for the saddle to be pretty level for the most part. Uh, the other, the other no-no is uh, running the saddle nose up. So if you've got the saddle nose up like so excessively, bearing in mind you can run, you can run it a little bit either either way. What this results in is posterior rotation of the pelvis. In English, rather than your pelvis being orientated like this, what happens is because with the with the nose of the saddle is elevated, it results in generally soft tissue pressure and erogenous tissue pressure, the rider typically rolls the pelvis back to get away from this, all right? Get, get, their, get their genitals away from the, uh, the nose of the saddle. That typically results in excessive uh, spinal flexion and makes the bicycle feel longer than it actually is. Also, it's just not very good for you. So common is this trait that a certain saddle uh, brand has developed a strategy, a marketing strategy and saddle selection system uh, based on a rider's ability to posteriorly rotate the pelvis. We won't mention any names because it'd be unfair on The pitch of the saddle will vary depending on the type of the saddle. Contoured saddles like this uh, Pro Turnix, which also include uh, saddles like the Specialized Roman, you're typically looking for, and when I say contoured, I'm talking about a saddle that has a higher nose and higher tail, but is more or less flat in the middle. What we're looking for on the saddle like this is for the middle portion to be more or less level. Unfortunately, it's quite difficult to measure, but to be honest with you, you don't really need to measure it. You get the bike flat on the floor, just eyeball it. You need to get down to its level and make sure that it's more or less level in the middle. Do not have it heavily angled. If you're getting saddle issues, do not increase the pitch of the saddle nose to, to reduce soft tissue pressure. It's probably occurring for another reason. There are 
and a number of other options. Sounds like this Pro Griffin, uh, we can also liken it to uh, a specialized toupee, Bontrager make a saddle called an Affinity or a Montrose. They're all pretty flat, more or less. I tend to set these up with about one degree of negative of, of nose slope, so that the nose is ever so slightly lower than the, than the tail is. Again, we're not look for, looking for it to be excessive, but we, we, we want it to be more or less flat uh, across the entire surface. So I mean, across the two highest points, which on this case, in this case, is more or less the front and the rear. One of my least favorite styles of saddle, it's the nose of the saddle, or short nose saddle, uh, made very popular by this particular model, which is a specialized power. And I, they, they've, they've come to fruition as a means of enabling you to get the seating area much further forward, uh, with, while still conforming to the UCI's five centimeter rule, which basically dictates that the nose of the saddle needs to be at least five centimeters behind the bottom bracket, okay? The problem with them a lot of the time is that they're too wide. And we have the, the sit bone measuring thing to thank, thank for this, but I'm going to talk about that in a bit. The seating area is too wide, which we find tends to result in uh, uh, a rider's need to gravitate towards the nose, which in this case is non-existent, and uh, cue saddle issues for the most part. Uh, again, you're kind of looking to, uh, to apply the same rules again, so we're looking for the, the middle portion of it, the middle third, to be more or less level. Again, it can, it can vary from, from saddle to saddle, but if we look at the, uh, my favourite one at the moment, which is Celitalia Boost SLR, uh, these I set more or less a, you know, one, degree neg uh, one degree nose down across the, uh, across the top of it. Um, the way you could, you could measure saddle pitch at home would be to get a clipboard and put it across the, the two highest points and then put a put an iPhone or, so, or digital spirit level on it and that will give you an idea of, of how much pitch you've got applied to it. Sounds like this tend to apply about two and a half degrees of nose down, these about one to one and a half, but never more than two and a half degrees, come to think of it. Something I can hear you all asking is, what about saddle width? And I gotta say that I, I, I feel as though saddle width has had a lot of fuss made out, uh, made of it. My instincts suggest that it's the manufacturers make a fuss of it as a means of making it feel more sciencey to sell saddles. And by that, I'm talking about these saddle selection systems that whereby you sit on something, they measure your sit bones, your ischial tuberosities, they measure the distance between those points, and that equals X saddle. Now, the problem with that, firstly, is how it's measured. Consider this: it's measured sat like this. And you don't sit on a bike like that. So the point being, you're measuring with the pelvis orientated like this. You then get onto a bicycle, the pelvis is orientated like this, so it's completely differently. Secondly, uh, what I tend to find this results in is a saddle that is too wide. And this is actually the more common problem that we have rather than saddle being too narrow. A saddle being too wide, as a reference, to, as I referenced earlier, tends to result in a gravitation or a need to gravitate away from that point because you catch your legs on the on the on the wings of it, and you gravitate towards the nose. Which, in some cases, as we pointed out earlier, you end up with saddle issues, and hand and hand and neck issues, all this other stuff. So, and, and my feeling is that this has been made a big thing because it makes the whole sale of saddles feel a bit more sciencey. Okay, I'm not saying that width isn't important, but it, it's nothing more than an element of saddle fit. So it needs to be uh, considered in combination with shape, style, and the, the specific needs of an individual. I would probably avoid going anything that's above 155 millimeters. Our most popular saddle is one of the most narrow out on the market. That Boost SLR we were talking about earlier is 135 mil. Uh, in the S3 iteration, that is one of our best selling saddles. So. Uh, I would say probably about that as a, as a minimum. And again, if you if you th consider rider physiology as a result uh, uh, when looking at this, so if you've got a very slender individual, they're possibly going to need a narrower saddle. If you've got a larger individual, they might need a wider saddle. But this isn't always the case. So the, it's virtually impossible to generalize about these things. These videos are intended to just offer you a little bit more of an insight as to what might be going wrong here. So I would say anything be up above 155 millimeters, I would say was quite is more likely to cause you issues than anything but I. I'm, I'm a firm believer in pressure relief channels. When I say prefer, pressure relief channel, I'm talking about there's a hole that's being cut out in the middle of the saddle. Now, I believe in this on the grounds that, as human beings, we weren't intended to sit on our genitals on hard pieces of foam, right? When you, when you interact with 
a saddle that doesn't have a pressure relief channel, it almost always results in compensation, like that posterior rotation of the pelvis we were talking about. People will also sit askew, they sit rotated, they just sit on the wonk. And this is one of the primary drivers for, for saddle issues like saddle sores and genital numbness. So to reduce a rider's compensation, I prefer pressure relief channel. Uh, it's typically uh, designed to uh, relieve pressure from the perineum, uh, but also soft tissue in women. At least 90% of the people that leave this room, leave with a saddle that's got a pressure relief channel, you, you know, quite often it's on the bike when it came in. Uh, but it's worth noting that if you move to a pressure relief channel and it causes you problems, it might not be the saddle, it might be the position. So for example, riders who run their saddle height excessively almost always sit off to one side, okay? They almost always list to one side. They usually list to the right, but not always. And what that results in is all their soft tissue missing this pressure relief channel sitting on this hard ridge here. And that's what quite often causes issues. Most saddle issues, I would say at least 80 to 90% of saddle issues have got nothing to do with saddles. You can reduce pressure going through the saddle by up to 50% just by putting arch support in the shoes. So if you're, if you're having saddle issues, this probably isn't the, good, the right starting point. Just a quick breakdown on uh, styles of saddle. So if we start with a traditional saddle, something like this Physique Arione, which uh, was designed by uh, Gilberto Simone on a serviette, uh, the, the only thought process in, on this is bellissimo. has been very, very popular over the years, it looks great, I rode one for 10 years, uh, and it enables you to sit here, 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 and here with a reasonable degree of comfort. This saddle is very good at masking poor positions. You'll quite often see certain individuals sitting right here, that's because they've got bad positions. But uh, that's one of the benefits of a saddle like this, is it, 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 it will enable you to be reasonably comfortable even in a very poor position, which is why I don't really use them very often. Most people leave here in good positions, I like to think. Lacks any pressure relief. It's typically relatively flat, but there are contoured versions of this. I physique make a saddle called a Yaliante, which is a lot more contoured and swoopy. Uh, to a certain degree, it's an element of personal preference. I Tent, and this isn't just exclusively physique, this is like, you know, there's lots of other brands that, that design saddles with no pressure relief. I just personally don't really like them, uh, and, and neither do most of my customers. A variation of that, which was started by uh, a saddle called the Specialized Toupee many, many years ago, was you took the traditional saddle shape, you cut a hole in the middle of it, and that relieves soft tissue pressure. Uh, it was supposedly uh, scientifically proven to reduce penile num numbness. Um, I don't know whether that's true or not, I just know that it, a, t a saddle of this type tends to result in a reduction in a rider's need to compensate when they interact with it. Uh, this is probably the saddle type and style that I would say 50 to 75, 50 to 70% of my customers end up leaving with. It's nice and flat, it's got a reasonably flat um, seating area and it's got a decent pressure relief channel. In contrast to that, there's a, con there's a contour version of it. Pro makes a, a saddle called a Turnex, very similar. It's just a little bit more swoopy. It's less, it tends to be less sharp in how it feels. So riders who are struggling with sit bone pressure, this can be quite a good saddle to go with because it isn't quite as flat at the back. Uh, again, large pressure relief channel, you just need to make sure you get that middle third flat. There are, of course, more extreme variations of that in saddles like the SMP. I used to sell a lot of these, I, I tend not to anymore, just on the grounds that, frankly, I found them very, very difficult to, to work with. Uh, they, they usually need to be set very, very far forward, usually in combination with an inline seat post. They do have, however, uh, very long rails, which means you, you, you have got a lot of adjustment to them, but because the, the seating area is really quite rearward, I found myself needing to run them very, very far forward. You can also ride one of these with quite a large variation of, of, of pitch, right up to the, the, the nose here being being a bit more positive than, than the tail. So again, I, we don't see very many of these. Most people, myself included, just can't get their heads around the look of the thing. Finally, Adamo. This is a potentially unpopular statement. Uh, these are fantastic on the right bike. In my opinion, this has no place on a road bike. These are typically designed for triathlon and time trial bikes, uh, whereby the position is a little bit more extreme, there's much more of a focus on aerodynamics, and they're intended to load a pelvis that is more anteriorly rotated like so, okay? This is one of the very few saddles you can fit to a road bike and not experience genital issues when it's too high. 
So we quite often see riders using these as a last ditch attempt to get comfortable when, again, as we, as we discussed earlier, the saddle isn't the cause of the problems. It's your bad position that causes the problems. The problem with running this on a road bike is it isn't really supportive enough, in my opinion. Uh, they're great for triathlon, they're great for time trial, doesn't need to be on your road bike. And then finally, the short nose saddle thing, uh, there are some the, some of these that work really, really well, we find this Boost SLR works fantastically. It comes in two different widths. There's a 135 and a 142 width. They also come in several different constructions. So like a 130 pound manganese rail saddle all the way up to a 300 pound full carbon jobby, which is what it's on your bike. And we're getting really great results with these. Uh, on the grounds that they actually aren't too wide, one of the problems with a lot of the short nose saddles is the flare angle, the angle at which these wings come out is too, is too extreme. Again, like I, as we discussed earlier in the video, it tends to result in a rider's need to gravitate towards the non-existent nose. Uh, so if, you, if you're thinking about short nose saddle, you like the look of them, this one's a good one to go with. To be honest, calling it a short nose saddle, it, it kind of isn't. It sort of sits between the, the short nose thing and, and the sort of more traditional um, saddle length in that, you know, you look at the actual overall length of the thing, it's only 15, 20 mil shorter. Uh, it's about 20 mil longer than, for example, a specialized power. That marks the end of today's episode of Bike Fit Tuesdays. If you have any questions related to the topic today or any topics that you would like covered, put them in the comment section down below. If you want to book a fit with James or one of his colleagues, I'm going to put the link to the website of this shop, which is based in Richmond in London, down below. Thank you for watching and goodbye.